Hello, uh, welcome to First Presbyterian Sunday School for the week of uh, February 28th, uh, 2021. We'll be continuing uh, my message in Revelation. If you have not heard my first part, I strongly suggest you go back to that because this will be a continuation of that. We went through the first five verses. Um, I talked about my viewpoint, how I'm going to approach Revelation, and uh, kind of what it is. Basically, I'm going to go through kind of verse by verse, talk about its connections to other pieces, and uh, hope that we can get something out of it through, uh, God willing, uh, through all that we do. All right. So last week, we left off right at the beginning toward the, the greeting, because I spent a lot of time kind of building up to what is Revelation. Uh, we had learned that it is from John, the apostle, um, the same one who wrote uh, the book. And he um, had a vision of Jesus. Jesus appeared to him. And uh, we're going to get into what, it, what happened when he appeared to him. He's on the Isle of Patmos. Um, it is an isle of exile made for the Romans at the time. Uh, there is a story that says that um, he was exiled there after they tried to kill him, and that didn't work out. Um, it was written, according to historians, around uh, 95 AD. Um, at this time, there was a fairly major persecution happening from a Caesar who thought he was God, and therefore didn't want to hear about any other gods, including Jesus, as we consider him God. Um, and he thought his own sons were the sons of God. So anyway, major persecution happening at the time. Uh, John is writing. First, he's going to write a letter to the seven churches, as we'll see, um, and then kind of goes on to tell a story about what seems to be the future, um, how he wrote it what, it, what it means, what it symbolizes. There's a lot of symbolism in there. Um, we can talk about that as we come to it. And this first, I just today we'll be just finishing off chapter one. And then we'll get into the letters of the churches, and we may not even get uh, to the actual future stuff before uh, my time with you is over. Uh, so I just want to just give you a brief overview of what we're doing. So here we are. Um, let's continue. So we're continuing here now in talking about uh, verse 5, end of verse 5, and it just kind of breaks into a praise uh, for Jesus and, and who he is. So him who loves us. And has freed us from our sins by his blood. Clear image of Christ and his death on the cross. And uh, what he has done for us through his um, sacrifice on the cross. And also oh, subsequent resurrection as we lead up toward that very thing here in the time of Lent. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory, power forever and ever. Amen. And indeed, we who claim Christ um, as Savior, as Messiah, God has ordained us in a special way, in a special place, to be heirs with him, with Christ, into the kingdom. Uh, we are part of that, and not necessarily part of where we are right now. Um, Yes, we might, as we live, live our lives according to whatever nationality we are. If you're in America, we might be Americans uh, from other countries, and we might be from those countries. But as we serve Christ, we realize we are from the heavenly kingdom more than any other kingdom um, on earth. Um, and we are priests. That is something, that, a distinction that is, is hard for us to understand. A priest, we think of someone who... Uh, who studies the scriptures often, uh, who administers the sacraments, um, uh, who at that time dealt with sacrifices and all these things. And yet the Bible says that we, we are priests. We are the ones who are connected to God. And for those of us who have had pastoral training, that might be great for us. But for some who have never had pastoral training, who have never really devoted themselves to the scripture, the idea that God is waiting for you and listening for you and listening to your word and what you have to say, and is also willing and, and, and able and, and can speak through you 
to others can be a very fantastical idea. That is what the scriptures tell us. It tells us that we, all of us, everyone who calls on Christ and believes in him, are priests. We are the, able to administer those sacraments and, and all of those things. Now, there might be logistics uh, at whatever church you are before you go up and be like, hey, I want to uh, do that thing. There might be some, some things within any given church body. But within the kingdom of God, God speaks and, and connects directly to you. you. You have no mediary, save maybe through Christ himself. Right Through his blood, we are connected to the kingdom uh, of heaven. And it's more from another book, and we get into to Hebrews and, the, and the, the need for mediaries and not mediaries. And some people think that they want to go to someone else and be like, hey, will you speak on, on, on my behalf to God? You don't need that. You speak on your behalf to God. But do it in humility. And of course, through the blood of Christ, who has freed us from our sins, by his blood. So indeed, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So that's the end of verse 7. In verse 8, we begin a description of, of Christ, and we'll, we'll kind of go in and out of this, especially as it goes into the letters to the churches. Those descriptions will be meaningful into each particular church as we get to them. And as a, when we get to the letter of churches, we'll talk more about what are those symbolizes? Are the churches uh, metaphors or are they just at that time? Or do they, what do they mean to us? Um, I'm definitely going to go with the opinion that, that all of scripture being God breathed is meant for all time. So what we can learn just for us, even the messages that were given to a, a king or a person. And he was like, oh, God has a message for you. And this is the message. And it was to that person specifically. I say, hey, yeah, but it's still for us. We can learn from that. Um, and more on that later. All right, so verse 8, uh, Revelations 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. All right. So we have the famous phrase, I am the Alpha and the Omega. We know from the Greek alphabet, he is saying um, he is the beginning and the end. So alpha is the first letter and omega is the last letter. For English speakers, this would be the same thing as he's saying he is the A, he is the Z. He is all. He is everything. He is from the beginning. He is to the end. At all times, in all places, in all ways. And this is something God says about himself says the Lord God. Lord, in this case, the same kind of concept that was spoken in the Old Testament, speaking of God and kind of hinting also at, at Christ and, and, and who he is, the Adonai, the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. That phrase, man, it's so powerful. Who is, he always is. When he, was spoke to a when he spoke to Moses, hey, who should I say he sent me to go say, hey, let my people go? The I am, the I am. I am the great one who is at all times. He is never a time when he is asleep, never a time when he is not focused on you or knows what's going on in your life. He is. He was. He's been there from the beginning. There was never a time he wasn't there. And who is to come? There will never be a time when he is not there. A connection that is always yours, that is always mine, that is always everyone's. God is, he was, and he will be. Does that mean that all answers to the questions will make sense? No. Unfortunately, you'll have to wait uh, for him and his glory and his understanding to decide when things make sense and when they don't. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, 
was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Basically saying, uh, verse 9, basically saying that, hey, I am here under the persecution. Uh, we endure through our knowledge of Christ. We endure um, in, in the kingdom of God and that he was sent there because of the testimony of Christ, that, that, that the burden was on him. And, but also that he didn't mind because if, to, to be persecuted in Christ's name, well, Christ suffered worse than that. So, verse 10. I was in the Spirit, and on the Lord's day, this could be on Sunday or just simply be, hey, this is the day that the Lord blessed. So he was in the Spirit. Um, there was a sense of otherworldliness to his moment. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Very common symbology, just saying that it was very loud. Um, it just boomed over everything. And it said, write what you see in a book. Send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus. To Smyrna. To Pergamum. To Thyatira. To Sardis. To Philadelphia. To Laodicea. Now on a map, all those cities were kind of connected by a major road as one after the other you would come to. There were also major cities that, that uh, Paul visited on his missionary journeys. They would be very familiar to everyone. They had uh, major congregations of people and, 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 and things were happening in those places. Because of the persecution, Not pe people weren't openly worshiping Christ because that wasn't necessarily allowed at the time. Um, but the churches maintained themselves in some sort of order. And he is writing then to these people. And, and God is speaking to him directly. This is one of those moments where it's not just, hey, let me pen a letter to that church that I have something on my mind that God moved me to. This is, God was there in front of me, and he told me exactly what to write. This is hard for a lot of people. He was in the spirit. How do we know that he wasn't just, you know, drinking too many spirits? You know what I mean? How do we know that this is truth? How do we know that this is trustworthy? Why, why do we trust this and not someone else who comes and says, oh, the Lord appeared to me and said such and such and such and such? Um, one, we're going to go with, this was written by John. John the apostle who knew Christ, who saw Christ, who was there. In, in, in Christ as he lived. Um, two, it was accepted by the people in the church at that time. Other people who knew him. And three, very importantly, it is consistent. All the imagery that is here in the book of Revelation is consistent theologically with the rest of Scripture. There is no point where it says, okay, you remember that thing that I said? That? We're going to throw that out. We're going to do this new thing. All of scripture, self-contained, not contradicted. So these are the things that I would look for when anyone comes forward with a new message. And it's something that I look for in, in John's book of Revelation as he says, oh, I was in the spirit and this is what the Lord said to me. I am looking for continuity with, with the rest of scripture and I find it. When I read through the book of Revelation, it is consistent with all the rest of scripture. Okay, so we have John, God speaking to him um, like a trumpet, blasting, can't be ignored, and uh, we're going to see what happens. So he turns to see the voice that was speaking to him, and on turning, let me see his, him speaking, on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, like one like a son of man clothed with a long robe, the golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Indescribable. I mean, he 
did his best, describing uh, seeing what he saw. In the midst of lampstands, like the Son of God, we're going to see the lampstands stand for kind of the midst of the seven churches, kind of representing the churches of the time. Long robe, golden sash, just that symbol of royalty. Um, and the hairs on his head were white, very wise and, and powerful, uh, white as snow, representing purity. Um, eyes were flaming fire, just again, representing his power and his presence and his ability to um, just, you know, it's hard to describe. If, you're, if you saw someone whose eyes are on fire, assuming they weren't, you know, in, a, in some sort of cartoon where there's a demon talking with the flames of the eyes, be pretty scary, but in this case, uh, the flames of purity in Christ. Um, uh, his feet were bur burnished bronze, uh, refined in a furnace. So this was just, again, another symbol of pur uh, uh, purity. This is also reaching back to the same imagery was used in um, Daniel, the book of Daniel, as it speaks of the future times and of things like this, the burnished bronze. Um, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Again, if you've ever been near the sea and tried to hold a conversation on a stormy day, uh, you can know that that's kind of really hard to do. Or if you were going to a waterfall, you ever been to a really big waterfall and watched it come down and uh, try to have a conversation with anyone else? No, it's really hard to do because all you can hear is the waterfall. Now imagine that, but the waterfall was actually using words speaking to you. Try ignoring that. Uh, selective hearing might uh, might go out the window at that point as we listen to the words of God as he spoke them directly to John. So um, in his right hand, he held seven stars. Again, we're going to talk about seven. Seven is a very number that is very complete, uh, very spiritual. We, we understand that the, the number seven is a very complete number, oftentimes referred to God. God will, the number seven will come up a lot in the book of Revelation. Seven churches, seven lampstands, seven seals, seven trumpets. Uh, again, just the imagery that is used uh, for completion of, of God. Um, from his mouth comes a two-edged sword. We can see that this is the word of God. Literally, word of God is a sword uh, to be used. It's a two-edged sword. He will cut Anything in his path, two-edged swords, kind of just this imagery of fierceness, uh, of um, strength, and that it will it will cut what it's going towards. And his face was like the sun shining in full full strength. Um, most of the imagery used in the Old Testament, talking about uh, the presence of God and God showing up, left people with their faces shining. Um, we we have the the imagery of Moses that he came down off the mountain. And had to put a wrap around his face because his face was shining too much. It was just too bright. Just being near God. Imagine Christ, who is God himself, uh, there. I imagine I, too, would do as John did, which is when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Um, you watch this being come forth. In the magnitude and the and the majesty and the power and the presence, uh, just step forth in front of you. I believe that you too would fall down dead. One of the negative side effects of living in a society where we have imagery all over the place, where we have TV shows that we can watch and we have CGI and movies and it shows us the big thing and oh wow, that's so amazing how big that is it's hard for our imaginations to break forth from that and come to the realization that there are things bigger that no TV camera can describe, that no computer programmer can program, that no imagery masterer can master. Being in the presence of God is indescribable. It's incalculable and I think we would all like John fall uh, at his feet as if dead um, and hopefully he would do as he did for John lay his right hands on on him this is verse uh, verse 17 uh, saying fear not 
I am the first and the last. Again, kind of the alpha, the omega. He just said that. And the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen. Those that are, those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves. So God speaking again to that seven, that idea of seven and, the, and what he had in his hands and speaking to those seven churches, all a powerful imagery, um, one and all toward the end. Uh, and this is the end of, Chapter one, and I think the end of my time um, doing Sunday school. I hope as we go through this thing, um, if you have questions, if like, hey, I didn't understand that imagery. If you have questions about, uh, oh, I had this thing I wanted to say about that passage, or I read this thing once. There are so many books on Revelation. I bet you have, have read through or some uh, message that was spoken to you from someone else who probably know, studied a lot. Uh, the book of Revelation, and you wanted to share that, please, um, you can probably email me um, or email Pastor Eric, and I would love to uh, hear about them and uh, do them. We were trying this the, the Zoom calls, but w hopefully this might work better for you. So uh, again, if you are able to, um, I will I make sure that my email is somewhere around, and you wanted to email me and hear a description. I'd love to answer questions if you had them. All right. Thank you. And uh, blessings of God be upon you.